Hey everybody, um, if you can hear me and see me, go ahead and let me know in the chat. No one's actually in yet. Hey everyone, if you can hear me, let me know in the chat if you don't mind. Alright, we got one at least. Fantastic. Good. And actually, I don't, I have not seen a list of your names or faces yet, so I'll be, I guess I could have like some uh, people coming by and just watching who aren't even in the class, but that's all right. Fantastic. I'll get started in just a couple minutes here. I like to just get on a few minutes early to um, make sure everything's working appropriately. Good. Um, how are you guys doing your other classes? Are you doing it like via Zoom or something or some other type of meeting software? Okay. Are you doing it in person? I know you're probably doing some labs and things in person, probably limited. Mm -hmm. But, uh,. Okay, yeah. Well, that'll work. Hopefully you guys have enough room to be socially distant while in class. <clears throat> okay. So I give the option. That's nice. Gotcha. Yeah, we're trying to limit for our fall semester, how much we're doing in person. So I'm gonna be streaming all all semester, I think. I'll have a few labs I'll go in for, but at least the traffic is not bad for these online courses. Good, that's fantastic. You guys seem like you're talkative in the chat, which would be good. Uh, make things a little more interactive for us. I used to pre-record all the videos for you guys and then post that up. So um, I think this will be a little bit better in terms of interactivity and getting to you know, explain things if you guys have questions or if something doesn't make sense, you know, we can talk about that. So are the thirty in your class? That's how many that were last time, I think. So hopefully everyone will have a chance to pop in here. I'll be recording this on my end too, so in case anything happens with the internet, if it goes down or something, I'll have a, a, the rest of the video I can post up too, so don't you guys worry about that. Perfect. All right, well, it's 8 o'clock. I'm going to start recording here. Uh, welcome to your farm class. This is my second year doing it for Gannon, and I'm changing it up a little bit from last time, doing it live for you guys. Um, hopefully, this will be a little bit um, you know, more interactive for you, and it'll help to you know engage you guys a little bit better in, in terms of learning and whatnot. Um, Looks like almost everyone is here, which is good. So um, I'll talk about a few tips for the class too when um, we go forward. Uh, I, I like to do this on on YouTube. I think the um, the quality of the stream is better for you guys uh, in terms of like sound quality and video quality. And most of the time, you guys don't like to turn on your camera and interact anyway during online sessions. At least that's been my experience, which I that's totally fine. I don't have any problems with that, but. Um, so this is better for you guys and you can always go back you can pause me you can rewind me you can watch this later so um this will be good from that standpoint and actually i got a lot of good evals from my uh 
classes over the summer that I did in this manner. So in terms of interaction, there's a few things you can do. Certainly, I encourage you to uh, put questions or anything like that you have in the chat. I will respond to those as we go forward. I also use a website called Linoit, uh, which I'm going to pull up here. And so if you were to see uh, the course website, actually I just posted this up a few minutes ago, but if you go under the instructional content, you're going to see um, something called Farm Sticky Board. And so this is a website where basically you can post anonymous sticky notes on here and ask questions. So if you don't feel comfortable putting your question in the chat, which is totally fine, you can post it up here and I'll probably get to that at the end of the lecture. Um, so yeah, so don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm never going to make anyone feel stupid for asking a question because this is a new topic for everyone. This is only your second day of PA school as far as I know. So um, you're not really expected to know much and so that's totally fine. So anyway, so I'll check that out towards the end of the class here. I know we're scheduled for two hours. I will most likely go probably till 940 or so. So kind of like having two 50 minute blocks. Um, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see how much I can get through. Um, you saw the syllabus is there along with a course schedule. So these dates are tentative in terms of the test, but the weeks are going to be when the tests are actually going to happen. I'll talk about the test here in a few minutes. Um, so you can check that out. Check out your syllabus and all of that. If you have questions, just let me know. That's, uh, that's all fine. So let me go ahead and get started here in terms of the lecture. So welcome to farm one. Um, this is going to be the course introduction starting out. And if I don't finish the slides in this section, that's fine. We'll get caught up next week. Um, so who am I? You're probably wondering, who's this guy on the internet? Why are they not in, in class? Uh, well, I am Adam Wood. I am a pharmacist by trade. Uh, I've been a pharmacist since 2010. So this is actually 10 years out of school for me, which makes me feel so much older uh, every single time I, I read that. And uh, once I graduated, you know, in, in terms of pharmacy, and most of you, when you think of pharmacist, you probably think about the guy at, uh, or the guy, or the girl at um, CVS or Walgreens or something like that. And certainly there's a lot of pharmacists that do go into retail. Um, that was never my inclination. I just didn't really enjoy it a whole lot. And so I wanted to do something more clinical. And so there's certainly a lot of clinical tracks you can take. So what I did is I actually did a two-year fellowship in toxicology and emergency medicine. I did that here at the Florida's Poison Center. And so um, technically I'm a clinical toxicologist as well as a pharmacist. Um, and so I still take call for them a couple nights a month. Um, so if you ever call the Poison Center, potentially you might get a hold of me and, and talk to me about some of the cases you might run into in your future. But uh, from there, I moved down to Orlando and I became the first uh, pediatric emergency medicine pharmacist at Nemours Children's Hospital. And I still work there uh, on a per diem sort of basis, uh, kind of go in there and work every once in a while. And so, you know, I did that for, for a bit and that was cool. And um, I eventually got into a management position, which really wasn't my thing either. And you know, during this time, I started working as a um, as an adjunct professor for the Nova Southeastern Orlando PA program, and I really, really enjoyed that. It was kind of like a side hustle at first, but then I really found I just it was just the most fun thing I did all week. So I ended up switching over, and so now currently I'm full time at Nova Southeastern, but I have a few um, other schools I teach for, including you guys, and so um, that's that's where I'm at. And so I've been doing this for two years for Gannon. Um, so, you know, I'm still kind of finding out the best way to, to, you know, deliver the content to you guys and, and all of that. So if you have suggestions, especially during the course, feel free to let me know if you are thinking, eh, you know, this isn't really working or I'd rather this happen. I'll, I'll certainly take a look at that and see if it's something we can do to try to help enhance your learning at all. So this course, though, what are we going to do? Well, basically, we're going to cover the sort of fundamentals of pharmacology. We're going to be talking about the basics and then talking about, you know, the pharmacokinetics and the dynamics of how drugs work in the body. And then that's going to lead us into talking about specific disease states and organ systems and all of that. And this should pretty closely mirror your medicine courses. Um, so in terms of like what topics you're covering, uh, you know, when you're covering GI in my class, you should be covering GI roughly around the same time in your medicine courses. So that way it helps to, um, one, you get to hear it multiple times, and then two, you get to hear it from multiple perspectives. Because if you're learning it from like a physician or a PA, 
they have their own perspective on things. And then you can hear it from my side too. So that way you can kind of think about it both almost like a PA and a pharmacist at the same time um, in order to get sort of a more holistic view of kind of like, well, you know, what are the different considerations I should think about when trying to diagnose and then treat a patient for a given condition. And so, of course, you want to know about your grades, you want to know about tests and all of that. There's going to be three tests throughout the course, and you can find the, the grade breakdown in your um, in the syllabus. But they're non-cumulative tests. They are 50 questions each, and they're going to be four answer choices. It'll be randomized up, and then we'll take those online. So um, that worked out pretty well last semester, so no, no issues with that. There's also going to be three prescription assignments, and we'll talk more about that as we get closer to those dates. So those will be something you'll actually handwrite and get some practice in writing the prescriptions you're going to do while you're out there in um, on your rotations and, and working clinically. And then there's going to be some other kind of ancillary sort of um, participation kind of uh, things here. So for instance, there's going to be practice quizzes. So it'll be quizzes you can take multiple times to get a feel for the kind of questions I ask on a test and to make sure you're getting sort of the more um, kind of broad topics down in terms of your, your um, apprehension of the, the content. And there's a few readings as well that can kind of help you out in terms of solidifying some of the things we'll cover in class here. So some tips uh, for pharmacology. So um, one, this is a new language. So um, there's going to be a lot of things you may hear that, you know, the, at first you may think like, what the heck is he even talking about? But if you listen to it a few times, I think it, it will kind of solidify in your mind. And so that's why practice is super important here. So practice it um, with each other, ask questions of one another. Um, you know, if you're not sure about something, like certainly reach out to me. Um, using, you can use my uh, Nova email address, awood2 at nova.edu. Definitely reach out to me early if you have any questions about things. I'm generally pretty good about responding back to people. Uh, and use your resources, right? So, uh, for instance, through the Gannon Library, you have Dynamed. Dynamed is a really good um, resource for you to go up and look up disease states and look up uh, how do you diagnose it, how do you treat it, how do you monitor, all these different things there. Use your fellow students. Some people will be coming in with experience already that may be beneficial. You may not. doesn't really matter. But, you know, work with each other. To make sure that you know you all have a good understanding of the of the content and near their faculty too right so just make sure to reach out early rather than later please keep up with these videos you know if you can't make one of these live streams it's going to be recorded so um you know i encourage you to be here live because that gives us the opportunity to talk about it in real time um, but if you can't just let me know and um, you can always catch back up and watch it later but don't wait until like the day before the test and you're watching a bunch of videos it's just not going to work out very well for you that's generally been how i've seen it in the past and again there are no stupid questions if you don't understand something that's a good question for you to ask uh, and i can guarantee you in my classes that if you have a question you're almost guaranteed to have someone else who has the same question who has also not asked it so please post it up Either do it anonymously email me do it in the chat whatever uh, i just want to make sure that everyone has a good understanding of this stuff so let's get into the content. If you have any questions in, in the meantime, please feel free to post that up. <clears throat> so getting into it. So um, talking about drugs, right? Drugs uh, are the main focus here because this is pharma, obviously. So when we're talking about drugs, there's a couple of different ways we can refer to them. Uh, most of you are prob probably familiar with the topic or the idea of a trade name in a generic name or the trade name or the brand name you may see. So for instance, here we have ibuprofen. Um, ibuprofen is the generic name. That's the chemical substance that got approved by the Food and Drug Administration. But you may mo more commonly refer to it as things like Motrin or uh, Advil. Those would be the trade names. That's something that the company uses exclusively uh, when they are marketing and selling it out there in the marketplace. So that's how you'd refer to the individual drug itself. You can then sort of fit it into sort of a more broad sort of classification. So we talk about the pharmacotherapeutic classification here. We could say that ibuprofen is an NSAID. Most of you have probably heard the term NSAID before, but may not know what it is or what that means. And so basically it stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? So you kind of already know a little bit about the drug just by knowing what category it falls into. Non-steroidal, so I know it's not a steroid, and it's an anti-inflammatory drug. It tells you a pretty good a bit about that drug already, about how you might use it for a given disease state. Uh, and then getting into the mechanism of action, this is really important to understand when we go over individual drugs. If you don't understand 
you know, the mechanism of a drug and how it's interacting with the body, then you're not going to understand a lot of things like, well, what kind of side effects can I expect from that? What sort of uh, disease states might this work for uh, as compared between different types of, of drugs? And so in the case of ibuprofen, it's a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. Cyclooxygenase or COX enzyme is responsible for a lot of inflammation. And so by using it to inhibit that enzyme, we have an anti-inflammatory drug. So don't worry about memorizing this right now. We'll get more into that later. I'm just giving an example of what a mechanism of action might look like. And then you'll have indications for drugs. Some of these will be approved by the FDA, and sometimes you'll hear about off-label uses for drugs. We use things off-label all the time. Generally, we have some amount of clinical evidence behind doing that. Um, and so we're not just using drugs for random indications willy nilly, but a lot of times we are using them for the FDA approved indications here. And in this case, we would see that it's indicated for anti-inflammatory therapy. So if you twist your ankle and you're having a lot of uh, swelling and heat at the site, this can be used to decrease that inflammation. It's an analgesic, meaning it works for pain. It's also an antipyretic, meaning it helps to treat fever. So these are the things you would most commonly sort of use for in this particular drug, right? So all drugs are going to have these in terms of mechanisms and indications and all of that. So um, when we get into the term pharmacology itself, like what does that really mean? And so basically it's kind of looking at two sides of a coin. So it's the study of the reaction of drugs in the body. Not only that, but not between drugs and the body, but also between different drugs because you know most patients uh, a lot of them don't just take one drug frequently they're taking multiple they could take a dozen drugs perhaps uh, and so it's important to understand one how they're interacting the body but also how are they working either against each other or maybe they're intensifying each other we're going to get into that and you can break it down into both the pharmacodynamics and then the pharmacokinetics and you're like well what does that mean well Basically, the pharmacodynamics is the study of the mechanism of action of the drug in the body, right? So we're going to look at things like dose response, where we compare the concentration of a drug, and then what sort of effect you're getting at on the body. If I give 10 milligrams of a drug and I get this sort of effect, what happens if I give 100 milligrams, right? And this can include both the therapeutic and the toxic effects, right? When I say toxic, that means all those adverse effects, all of those um, adverse reactions you might see there. <clears throat> So for instance, if I were to give you the drug Benadryl, Benadryl is a brand name, uh, the generic being diphenhydramine. Um, if I give that to you to treat your allergies, right, to decrease some of the uh, effect of histamine causing allergies and, um, you know, you're causing stuffy nose and your eyes are watering, all that stuff, itchy, um, that would be a therapeutic effect. But also, what's a common side effect of Benadryl? Well, most of you probably have taken it before and realize that it caused you to kind of get kind of sleepy. And that could be a toxic effect if you need to, say, be awake at 8 o'clock for a farm lecture, for instance. Um, or, in some cases, we actually use it for sleep. So you can see sometimes the effects here may change depending on the context. And either it may be therapeutic or it could be a toxic effect, right? And so overall, what you can call pharmacodynamics is basically how the drugs are affecting the body specifically. So what effect does the drug have on the body? What does it do to the physiology of that person? And what sort of effects do we see there? So as an example, I use ethanol. As an example, most people have probably either uh, consumed ethanol themselves, so they have some personal experience, or they have seen other people consume ethanol. No judgment either way. But if you look at the example of different doses on the clinical effects you'll see on a person, this is a really good example. So for instance, if you have, say, one to two drinks of ethanol, maybe you experience some loss of inhibitions. Maybe you get some social lubricant effect where that that attractive uh, potential mate across the bar, maybe you want to go talk to them now. Maybe you would have been too apprehensive about doing that previously. Now you might decide to do that. It's a low-dose sort of effect of alcohol. Well, what if I were to then increase that? Maybe you get three to four drinks into you. Now you're starting to slow your speech. You're incoordinated. You're, uh, you're ataxic. So as you're walking over to that person, maybe you start to stumble and then you trip and fall. Uh, that's a moderate dose effect. And then say you start doing shots. Not recommended for a lot of people, but let's say things are going great at that night. Perhaps you just passed your first farm test, who knows. Um, that's where you can start to see things like respiratory depression and syncope that can happen here, right? Again, all of it has to do with what kind of dose you're receiving. You can see that there's sort of an escalation of the effects you're going to get there. And that's what ethanol specifically is doing to the body. So that's the pharmacodynamic effects of ethanol, right? <clears throat> 
So then the flip side of that coin uh, from pharmacodynamics is going to be the pharmacokinetics here, right? So this is instead of what the drug is doing to the body, this is what the body is doing to the drug. So in terms of how does it move throughout the body and what is the body doing to it to get it ready for elimination? There are very uh, few to no drugs that if I give it to a one dose to a patient, I never have to give it again because it, it's going to stick around forever. It's very rare that you would see that. Um, but instead, what you're going to find is that we're looking at the concentration of the drug versus time in terms of if I give a dose of a drug, how does it get absorbed into the body? You know, obviously, things like oral administration is going to be far different in terms of uh, absorption than it would be if I were to give it topically on the skin, for instance. Once it's in the body, how does it distribute itself? Does it stay in the bloodstream? Does it like to go out to the tissue? Where does it need to work at in order to be effective, right? If I am treating a pneumonia, I probably want to make sure that my antibiotics are getting to the lungs, but that may be difficult depending on how drugs distribute in the body. And then we'll talk about the metabolism of the drugs. Most of you are probably likely to know that the liver is going to be a big hotspot for drug metabolism. We're going to talk about that extensively. And then how do we excrete or eliminate the drugs? You know, frequently we'll talk about the kidneys in, in terms of excretion. So overall, it's uh, A, D, M, and E is the acronym I use for the kinetic sort of parameter. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of drugs. And so overall, this is how the body is affecting the drug. So pharmacodynamics, how the drug is affecting the body. Pharmacokinetics is how the body affects the drugs. Okay. And again, if you have any questions popping up here or anecdotes or whatever, just put them in the chat. We'll talk about them. Um, and so, as an example of kinetics here, uh, let's go back to ethanol, right? So, we talked about the physiologic effects of and the pharmacodynamic effects of ethanol. Well, what are the kinetic effects? And so, you can actually see here that depending on the type of person you're talking about, you can actually see big changes in the kinetics. So, for instance, if you had two patients who were, say, in your ER, they were presenting for nausea, vomiting, or whatever the reason they may be, maybe they got arrested at the bar or something like that. You could see that depending on the type of patient you're dealing with, they will have far different kinetics in terms of how they process the drug ethanol, right? So if I have an alcohol naive patient, say it's someone's first time in undergrad in college and they're away from home and they decide to go to a party, they may metabolize roughly 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour of alcohol. That's about one drink per hour. Um, and so they may metabolize it, you know, pretty, pretty normally for someone who does not get exposed to alcohol often. But let's say we have someone who is chronically drinking. Let's say that they go through, um, you know, a couple of six packs a week or even more than that, maybe a couple of six packs a night. Um, they actually end up metabolizing much faster because they actually have this upregulation of uh, metabolism that occurs through the liver. Because the liver doesn't like it, it thinks it's a poison, so it tries to get rid of it faster. They may actually metabolize it, say, three to four times more quickly. And so if you're working, say, in that ER and you're looking at those two patients there, I know that the chronic drinker, depending on what their level is, they may actually be able to get rid of that alcohol much more quickly than someone who is alcohol naive, right? So that's a pharmacokinetic sort of uh, effect that you can see in terms of how they're going to process the drugs. This doesn't happen for all drugs, but this is just an example of what happens with ethanol specifically. So you can kind of break it down in terms of the kinetics and pharmacodynamics and looking at what's going on here in terms of uh, the, the actions of the drug. So I give a dose of a drug, whether it's IV, PO, you know, it means oral, whatever the case may be, it gets absorbed in whatever way. And then you're going to find there's some drug concentration in that systemic circulation. When I say systemic circulation, I'm talking about the blood, uh, uh, the plasma, basically, right? So what's actually circulating around in our vascular system. And then you'll see then that the drug will then distribute out into the surrounding tissues, right? It's going to go to the muscles, it's going to go to the fat, it's going to go to the lungs and all these different places here. That's the distribution of the drug. Some bit of it's going to be metabolized and or excreted. And that's going to be basically overall the kinetics of the drug. And then when you look at the amount of drug that gets to the site of action, whether it be the heart or where, where the brain, wherever the drug is working, that's where we get our pharmacologic effect. And that's going to include both our efficacy with the drug and also the toxicity. And this is mainly going to be the pharmacodynamics we're talking about at that point. So kind of break it down into these two halves here in terms of how the body's processing the drug and then what that drug is actually doing to the body in terms of changing our physiology. So a couple other terms we'll run into uh, include things like pharmacogenomics. This is uh, an important uh, thing that it gets more um, 
important as time goes on as we learn more about how um, people's genetics actually play a role in terms of their response to a drug. Um, so you can actually find that in some populations or some people that have specific um, genetics, they may be a better or a worse candidate for a given drug because may, they may either have a better response to it, they may have a very poor response to the drug. And as time goes on, we actually get better at being able to do you know, more cheap and easy tests to find out if these people might be a good candidate for a drug or not. And that allows us to, uh, instead of, you know, kind of just saying, okay, let's try this drug and see how it works. We may be able to more prospectively sort of decide what drug might be best for a patient based on their genetics. So as a, an example of this, there's an, uh, a drug to treat HIV um, that if you give it to the wrong person, that they have a specific polymorphism, specific mutation, they're very likely to have an anaphylactic reaction. And so you don't want to just give a drug to a patient and have a, you know, a decent likelihood they could have an anaphylactic reaction. So then we test for that mutation beforehand. And if they have it, we don't give them the drug. And if they don't have it, then we can give them the drug, right? So uh, these, this will get more um, prolific as time goes on and things become cheaper and easier to do. So we talked a lot about drugs so far, but what is a drug? Well, basically, it's going to be any substance that brings about a change in biologic function through its chemical action. And so we're going to see that drugs... We're going to talk about a lot of those. We're also going to talk about receptors frequently as well. We're going to see that um, we're going to talk about this in a lock and key sort of um, analogy here. And so drugs are going to be the key, right? So this is going to be the thing that you take. It's going to interact with some part of the body, whether it be at the cell surface, whether it be at the DNA in the nucleus of a cell, wherever it happens to be, this is the key that's going to be changing some degree of biologic function. The receptors we're going to talk about is that lock, right? And so, uh, again, this may be residing on the cell surface. It could be located in the cell itself, depending on uh, what kind of drug and what type of action we're talking about there. And it's going to be initiating whatever chain of events that occurs that leads to a drug's observed effect, right? So, for instance, if I give you a diuretic, which is a drug that makes you urinate, which is frequently used for hypertension, you're going to find that the drug itself is going to interact with the receptor that causes you then to urinate more, right? So that's the, that would be the chain of events that occurs that leads to the effect that you're going to get up and go to the bathroom more often, right? So the receptor is the lock that we're dealing with. And you're going to find that most receptors tend to be proteins. So this means it could be an enzyme, it could be a transporter protein on the cell surface, um, but it could even be other things too. It could be DNA targets. Um, so for instance, there's a lot of chemotherapy drugs that we use for cancer um, that interferes directly with a cancerous cell's DNA to prevent it from replicating, or like antiviral drugs and things like that. And we'll talk more about these as we get to them. And overall, we're going to find this plays a strong regulatory role, right? Because the body if you're not familiar, um, likes to maintain homeostasis, right? It resists change if it possibly can, right? So you're going to see that if you push something, the body is then going to try to fight that, right? And so it does that by trying to um, regulate how much a drug can uh, affect the system. And so that means that if I am overstimulating receptors, it can regulate that and say, okay, well, I'm having too much activation here. Let me downregulate the system here. Maybe they'll produce less receptors. Or maybe if I'm blocking a bunch of receptors, it's going to then say, okay, well, I'm not getting enough activity. Let me try to upregulate the number of receptors that are available. We'll talk more about that regulation a little bit later on, though. And so basically, we can kind of think about um, the kind of think about this almost like a chemical equation a little bit. So looking at this interaction between a drug, which another term here is going to be ligand, basically anything that binds to that receptor, and talk about the interaction between these two here. So basically, if you have a drug, again, it has a specific sort of shape to it that's going to be able to interact with that receptor. You're going to see here that both of them can interact or can exist by themselves. But what we're, what we're looking for when we give a drug is to make sure that we have this interaction occurring So because this is what leads to that effect, right? And so I can modify this equation. I can push it to one direction or the other by either changing the amount of drug that I have or the body can affect this by changing the amount of receptors that are available. So if I add more drug on this side of the equation, it's going to push it over to this side. I'm going to have more drug interacting with more receptors. And I should see more effect. That makes sense. If you give a bigger dose of a drug, you get more effect out of that, right? Um, versus if I were to say remove receptors because the body is trying to resist change, then that will then prevent this interaction from occurring as much and so you get less effect. So we'll talk more about those issues that pop up a little bit later on. But this, I want you to kind of start thinking about this interaction between drugs and the receptors that they're binding to and leading to some of these effects here.
And again, I mentioned that a ligand is a pretty generic term. It's really anything that binds to that receptor. Um, it could there are endogenous ligands, right? So for instance, um, I have my body produces insulin, right? Insulin interacts with insulin receptors. That's a pretty advanced topic there, right? Um, but I can also provide exogenous ligands. I can give you, uh, say, uh, human-made types of insulin that are engineered to interact or kind of work differently than what normal insulin does, and that would be an exogenous ligand. I would just give that, say, subcutaneously to a diabetic patient that cannot produce their own insulin, for instance. So really it's anything. It could be stuff that we produce ourselves. It could be any kind of um, exogenous materials that we're providing, you know, basically drugs that we're giving um, patients. And so some other examples would include things like neurotransmitters. So we'll talk a lot about like epinephrine and serotonin. Uh, we'll talk about drugs, obviously, here because we're in our farm class. It could be messenger molecules like antibodies. Anything really can be considered a ligand as long as it interacts and binds to a receptor. So when I talk about hormones, that's basically any sort of natural substance that's produced in the body that influences the way that it grows or develops. And so you can kind of think about hormones as being the body's own kind of drugs, right? So um, if you want to grow the body, well, I can keep provide it with um, endogenous hormones that are going to cause that body to grow. So things like insulin and things like testosterone, things that are anabolic hormones, for instance, or say you can provide cortisol if the body is inflamed, or if the body is stressed, you can provide cortisol as a natural response to that. So the body kind of has its own um, kind of drug cabinet that it can utilize in order to affect many different things. And sometimes this goes wrong, right? Sometimes you can have way too much cortisol, leading to a lot of problems with patients, or maybe not enough and things like that. But hormones are anything that's helping to influence that. We'll talk a lot about hormones like in the endocrinology section later on. Um, and then a xenobiotic is really any chemical compound that's foreign to a living organism. So any drug we're giving would be considered a xenobiotic. Um, so talking about uh, toxins, this is basically poisons of a biologic origin. So uh, if you were to think about things like snake or spider venom, which, you know, being here in Florida, we have uh, our fair share of venomous snakes here. Um, but you can also think about things like a botulinum toxin, right? And so um, botulinum toxin is a very uh, potent paralytic, but it comes from a biologic origin. So we call that a toxin. And mainly we, we look at toxins as causing harmful effects. Although we can sometimes use these for beneficial effects too. So um, some of you might want to go work in dermatology or work more on the aesthetic side of things and use Botox to help patients um, achieve their aesthetic goals, right? So um, sometimes we can use really harmful toxins for therapeutic benefits. I use this um, more frequently on the pediatric side of things um, because we can actually inject this into certain muscles to allow them to relax for patients to have a lot of spasticity and things like cerebral palsy and whatnot, right? So even though it's considered a toxin, we can find there are clinical effects potentially. Toxicants is another term um, that really is any sort of poison from a non-biologic origin. So this can include things like lead and other heavy metals, pharmaceutical poisonings and all of that. And all of these go into the field of toxicology, which is basically that study of really harmful or poisonous effects on the body. And so um, this is something I'm really passionate about. I've always thought it was really cool in uh, school when I was like learning about drugs and I was like, okay, that's, that's great. That's what it does normally. What happens if I crank it up to 11 and I give a whole ton of drugs to the patient, right? Not that I would ever do that on purpose, but sometimes that happens. Sometimes medical errors happen. Sometimes patients do this to themselves on purpose. I wanted to learn about that and then how to reverse that stuff, right? So that's how I got really interested in the field of toxicology. So another definition here, an agonist. An agonist is anything that binds to a drug and then activates the receptor, okay? And so then it's gonna either directly or sometimes indirectly bring about the effect you're looking at. So as an example, uh, beta-2 agonist, the drug albuterol that you use for asthmatic patients most commonly. This is a beta-2 agonist. This means it agonizes the beta-2 receptor. What happens when that occurs? Well, it causes the smooth muscle in the respiratory tract to relax and allows for easier airflow, right? So this is a drug that binds to the beta-2 receptor and then activates it. That's an agonist, okay? And again, don't remember this specific example here. We'll talk more about that in the pulmonology section later on. When we're talking about how things bind to the receptors, there's a few things we can talk about. So one of which is being affinity. How tightly does a drug actually bind to that receptor? Some drugs are gonna bind very tightly. Some drugs may have a harder time binding and it may not be as quite of a, a tight fit between that lock and that key. And so 
one of the things we can look at in terms of um, talking about affinity is actually the potency of the drug. So like how much drug do I need to actually elicit a response out of that patient? And typically things that are higher potency require smaller effective doses, right? So what does that mean? So let's compare two opioids, right? So these are drugs that are used for analgesia. Most of you have probably heard of morphine and many of you have probably heard of fentanyl as well. Fentanyl is actually a big problem in a lot of, um, it's found in a lot of heroin nowadays on the streets for patients who have opioid use disorders. Um, but this is a frequent thing you're gonna see in the surgery realm for those of you interested in surgery. Now to care, uh, compare the two together, morphine, for like an effective dose, say I'm giving an IV dose of morphine for someone that just fractured uh, their femur, for instance. Maybe I wanna give like five milligrams of morphine to that patient IV. To get a uh, comparable dose of fentanyl, I'm dosing that maybe say 50 to 100 micrograms, right? So milligrams versus micrograms, that's a thousand fold difference, right? So I'm needing a much less drug of the fentanyl to get the same effect as the morphine. So fentanyl would be considered to be more potent. I need less of it to get the same effect as the morphine, right? And so this is a good way to compare different drugs together. You might wonder like, why am I dosing this drug in grams and this one in milligrams, this one in micrograms? All of it has to do with that potency and the affinity for it at the receptor. And then more importantly, clinically, we're going to talk about the efficacy. So like the drug's ability to actually produce a maximally desired response. So um, again, if I had someone who fractured their femur and I'd say, here's a dose of ibuprofen for you, they're probably going to be pretty mad at me because I'm not really giving them something that's effective for the amount of analgesia they require, right? Versus if I were to give them fentanyl, they may feel much better after that dose has been given. So you could say for analgesia, fentanyl is much more efficacious than ibuprofen. Although if you like sprained your ankle, I'm probably not going to be running to the cabinet to get the fentanyl for you. Ibuprofen may be more appropriate. So overall, efficacy is going to be uh, important in terms of context of how we're using it. So Rachel, uh, and if I mispronounce your name, let me know if I, I do that. But um, Rachel is asking, if a drug has a lower affinity, does that mean that it's less effective? Not necessarily. Sometimes we can get around affinity by modifying the dose. Sometimes by giving more drug, that allows it to, even though it doesn't really bind super tight to that receptor, um, we can give more of it to try to help facilitate more meetings of that drug to that receptor. And so sometimes we can get around that. And again, clinically, when you're working, you may not be thinking about well, how, what's the affinity of this drug for the receptor. But when you're looking up the dosing of different drugs, so you're looking at the difference in, in dosing between like, you know, morphine versus fentanyl versus something else. Um, when you're comparing that, those, all those together, you'll see that why are they dosed this way? Well, a lot of it goes back to these sort of fundamentals, looking at the affinity, looking at the potency, the efficacy and all of that. And ultimately, what do you care about as a clinician? We care about the efficacy much more than the potency. We really just work on the potency to determine what's an appropriate dose to get the effect that we're really looking for. So again, if I try to give milligrams of fentanyl to a patient, I'm gonna kill that patient pretty quickly because of how potent and how uh, efficacious the fentanyl is. So as I mentioned, um, efficacy is that drug's ability to produce the desired response. Well, things can be equipotent. Right, So I can have two different drugs that are dosed differently, but they achieve the same effect. Right, So as an example here, relative doses between two drugs to get the same efficacy. If I have 100 milligrams of drug A that maybe lowers blood pressure by 10%, and I also have drug B here, I only have to give 10 milligrams to get a 10% drop in blood pressure. These would be considered equipotent. Right? Or as the example I mentioned before with the morphine, five milligrams of morphine is probably equivalent to about 50 to 100 micro, uh, micrograms of fentanyl. Those are equipotent dosages. That's important because what if a patient comes in with a, a particular drug and we don't carry that? The hospital just doesn't have access to it. You can't stop their therapy. You gotta switch them to something else. You would want to find an equipotent dose of an alternative drug that you can give them in order to achieve that same effect. And so when you look at things like conversions between different types of drugs, um, that becomes really important. So we do this a lot, especially for like, um, for instance, for like sickle cell patients, we get that a lot on the pediatric side of things where they come in for a lot of uh, acute pain crises. And so they'll get admitted just for the, uh, the amount of pain that they're experiencing. And we may have to convert their home regimens of the drugs that they're on over to um, what we carry at the hospital. Cause you know, again, a hospital doesn't carry every single drug known to, known to humanity. We carry a select set because it's not really um, cost conscious to, to do that. So we carry a select set of drugs, we may need to convert them over, but you don't want them to stop getting their medication, the, the effects they're looking for. So we need to find 
equipotent dosages. So again, if you hear that term equipotent, that's what we're referring to. So going back to the idea of agonist, so not every drug that binds to that receptor actually fully activates it, right? So you can kind of think about it, like how far are you turning that key in terms of how much effect you're getting out of that, right? So the drug, is it going to be turning it all the way around? Is it a 360 turn on that lock? Is it only a, say, uh, 180 degree? I don't know if it's the best analogy, but that's how I think about it. So when I say a full agonist, that means that it's fully activating that receptor, right? So that means that if I were to give you enough drug to occupy every single receptor available that that drug interacts with, you're going to get 100% effect, right? If I bind 100% of the receptors, I'm going to get 100% effect. There's no way I could get any more effect out of that drug because it is fully activating that receptor, right? So if the most I could get out of it is only a 15% drop in blood pressure, even if I keep giving more drug, I'm never going to lower that blood pressure any further, right? It's a full agonist. But there's also partial agonist as well, right? So this is something that binds to the receptor, but maybe only partially activates it. Maybe it's only like a 50% effect, maybe it's 75, just depends on the drug, right? And so this means that if I were to occupy every single receptor available, maybe I'm only gonna get like 50% effect, maybe 75, maybe 10% effect, depends on the how much partial agonism is there with the drug. I'll give you a good clinical example of this in just a moment, but just know that there's full agonist, there's partial agonist, and again, could you say that the full agonist is probably more efficacious? Possibly, but in some cases, it may make sense to use a partial agonist. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a moment. Then again, to kind of show this in a pictorial example, this is what it would look like between a full agonist getting 100% effect versus a partial agonist only getting a 50% effect. And you can see the change here in reduction in systolic blood pressure, right? Now, this would not be a very efficacious drug if I'm only going to get a 10 millimeter mercury drop in blood pressure, but you get the idea, right? This is kind of just illustrating the point. So if you were to look at a graph of the concentration of the drug that you're administering versus the response here, um, you can kind of see the differences in terms of the amount of efficacy you can get from that, right? So looking at a full agonist, you're going to note here that the peak here, or this plateau effect, and, and you'll notice this plateau occurs when 100% of the receptors are being occupied, that the full effect you're going to get out of this is going to be much higher than the partial agonist because even if I'm occupying all of these receptors here you will notice that it just doesn't activate it as strongly and so you're not going to get as much of an effect out of that as compared to the full agonist okay now this may be appropriate maybe the patient only needs this much response maybe there's some other good things about the drug that make this a better choice but you're never going to get the same kind of efficacy okay so there's full agonist, there's partial agonist, but now we need to know about antagonist, right? And so some of you may come to view me as an antagonist in, in your life, who can say? But antagonist, when we're talking about that, that's basically going to be a drug that is going to be blocking or reducing the action of agonist, right? So this is something that's going to be binding to the receptor, but does not activate it at all. It is just blocking it up and preventing other things from coming and binding to it, okay? Now there's different types of antagonism. The main one you want to focus on is a competitive antagonism. Antagonism. This is the most common one you're going to run into. It binds to the receptor itself and prevents binding by other molecules. So as an example, if you've ever heard of a beta blocker, a beta blocker blocks beta receptors, right? And it says it right there in the name. Well, what do you use that for? We use it to lower heart rate. So you have someone who has very rapid heart rate, you want to slow that down. And what's causing that rapid heart rate? Well, maybe it's things like epinephrine and norepinephrine binding to beta receptors of the heart and causing it to speed up. Maybe you're having a fight or flight response. If I give a beta blocker, I can block those beta receptors and prevent things like epinephrine and norepi from binding to it. And that is then going to cause less effect out of this, some zero effect out of this receptor, and cause the heart rate to come down. Okay, so that's an example of a competitive antagonist. Note there, there's the competitive in the name, meaning that it's a uh, uh, depends on the concentration, right? So if I add more antagonist, I'm going to get more blockage of those receptors. If I add more agonist, I can overcome that and kick that antagonist off the receptor, right? It all is going to be in terms of the concentrations relative to the antagonist and the agonist. I'll give you an example of that in just a little bit. So um, there's other types as well. So for instance, there's allosteric antagonism. This is one that doesn't occur as often, but maybe instead of binding directly to the receptor, it binds somewhere off to the side, for example, and would cause a conformational change in the receptor leading to um, the drug not being able to bind to it as well, the agonist not being able to bind to it as easily. Um, there's other ones like chemical antagonism. So this is one where a drug will actually bind directly to the agonist, 
and render it inert, right? Um, so as an example, um, if I were to give you an antibiotic called a fluoroquinolone, so if you've ever heard of uh, ciprofloxacin or cipro, or if you've ever heard of levofloxacin or levaquin, if I give that to you orally and you take it with a glass of milk, the calcium in that glass of milk is going to bind to the drug and prevent it from being absorbed, right? That's a chemical antagonism because they bind directly to one another and um, basically prevent it from working, right? And again, if you hear my children in the background, I have a two and a four-year-old, so just FYI, you may hear some screaming, you may hear laughing, you may hear doors knocking, it is what it is, right? Uh, in some cases, you may find there is uh, what we call a functional antagonism. And so this is where the, uh, the physiologic actions of the agonist can be impeded by the antagonist, right? So I'll give you a good example of this. Let's say you have a, a patient with diabetes. Say they're taking insulin for their diabetes to help control their blood sugar. Well, if I give that patient something like a steroid, corticosteroid, I give them prednisone or dexamethasone or say solumedrol, a medrol dose pack, right? Those are all examples of corticosteroids. One of the actions of a corticosteroid is that it raises blood sugar. So now I'm giving the patient a drug to lower their blood sugar and insulin, and I'm also giving them something else to raise blood sugar. You can see how those two are fighting one another, and that's a functional type of antagonism, okay? So this is common for drug interactions to occur. If I give someone who's taking antihypertensive drugs a drug that raises their blood pressure, that's a functional antagonism, okay? They're kind of um, butting heads with one another. So we will look at different examples of those. Just know that in terms of like drugs that I'm administering to the patient in terms of antagonists, competitive antagonists are most common. And in terms of like drug uh, interactions, you're gonna see this is a pretty frequent one with the functional antagonism. But again, there's no activation of the receptor itself. It can bind to it, but it doesn't activate it. So here is again a pictorial example of a, a, say the natural ligand, the endogenous ligand binding to the receptor causing typical cellular activity. Here's an example of I give a drug, an agonist, that will then bind to the receptor site and cause sort of enhanced sort of effect. And here's what an antagonist would look like. It's kind of just like plugging up the receptor and preventing any natural chemicals or potentially agonists from binding to and activating those receptor sites, okay? So um, also there is an idea of, you know, are drugs, in terms of antagonists, are they reversible or are they irreversible, right? Typically, you're going to have um, drugs that most often are going to be reversible antagonists, which means that as long as the drug is around, it's going to work. But as soon as it gets out of the body, then it stops working, right? Because it's not around there to antagonize anything. So as an example with ibuprofen, this is one that will bind to that cycle oxygenase enzyme I mentioned before. Um, but as soon as the drug is metabolized and eliminated from the body, it dissociates from that enzyme and it doesn't work anymore. So one of the things you'll hear um, a lot about NSAIDs is that they can uh, increase your risk for bleeding. And that also has to do with its effect on platelets and cyclooxygenase in the platelets. So in this case here, it's a reversible antagonist. So as soon as the drug is out of the system, your bleeding risk goes down to whatever it was at baseline, right? Well, you can sometimes have irreversible antagonists. And so this actually forms a permanent sort of bond to where the drug's actions, actually, even if the level of the drug is zero in the body, it's still having its actions because it irreversibly has bound to whatever site it's working at. So as an example, here's aspirin. Now aspirin is something we frequently give for cardiac protection for patients. And why do we do that? Well, it's because it's an antiplatelet drug, right? So it's preventing um, those uh, you know, blockages in the coronary arteries that may be propagated by platelets, right? So this is good because it's an irreversible antagonist. So as soon as it binds with that cyclooxygenase, that's a permanent bond. So your body has to then produce new cyclooxygenase for the effects to be reversed. So the apparent durations of action and maybe the risk for bleeding is a lot longer for aspirin than it is for ibuprofen. But that's okay because if you um, if you ever see someone taking aspirin for cardiac protection to prevent MI, ask them what dose they're taking. They say, oh, I take a baby aspirin. Like, why do you take a baby aspirin? You're an adult. Well, because you don't really need a whole lot of it because of this irreversible effects you're gonna see there. I can take 81 milligrams or baby aspirin a day, and that provides just enough action because it's an irreversible antagonist that it basically protects that patient and prevents their risk. I don't have to give any more in order to get the effects that I'm looking for, right? So if you ever hear some, why someone takes a baby aspirin, that's the reason why. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, most of the times we're gonna be running with competitive antagonists. And again, you're gonna see that the concentration of the agonist versus the antagonist really determines that effect there. So if I have more antagonist around, I'm gonna get more of the antagonist effect. If I have more agonist around, 
I'm going to get more of the agonist effect. So they're kind of fighting one another, and it's kind of a battle of numbers. So whatever is in the higher concentration, along with whatever has the better affinity, is going to win out. Okay, so I can modify it on, on kind of how it's going to go. So for instance, if I have someone who um, maybe took too much of a beta blocker <clears throat> and their heart rate is too low, I can then give them extra agonists to try to reverse that effect. So I can give them epinephrine IV to try to then reverse that effect and try to get their heart rate back up as an example. Sometimes you'll have what we call non-competitive antagonists. This doesn't come up as frequently, um, and they're more difficult to sort of counteract. But basically, it's one of those things where you have, like, um, say, like a uh, allosteric binding or something like that, where uh, it prevents it from, um, you know, or it's like a, you know, irreversible bound binding or something like that, to where basically the receptor just has to be regenerated. It says, you know, uh, the the this, the affinity is so strong or it makes a covalent bond or something like that with the receptor that the, the receptor is basically no good anymore. Basically just means it has to be regenerated and, and form a brand new one. And so this can be more difficult to counteract if that's what you need to do, but just know that far and away competitive antagonism is the most common one. <clears throat> Here's an example if you were to give um, an agonist alone versus looking at an agonist plus a competitive antagonist. And so what you can see here is that, you know, the blue line here, it was working like normal. It looked like that same graph of what we were looking at previously, but a full agonist. Versus when you add in a competitive antagonist, notice here the effect is lessened. And that's because these are both competing for the same binding sites. So some of the receptors are being blocked up by the competitive antagonist. Some of them are being activated by the agonist. That's why you notice a reduced effect here. However, if you keep increasing the concentration of the agonist, you notice here that eventually it's going to be pretty similar to what it was at with just the full agonist by itself because if I keep increasing the concentration of agonist and I don't do anything to the concentration of the antagonist, you'll notice here that it wins out by numbers alone and you can eventually get full effect out of that. Okay, So just know here that it's going to be a matter of looking at the concentration of the agonist versus the competitive antagonist to see where that effect is going to be at. Okay. So here's a good clinical example that is appropriate because, again, we're in Florida. We have the opioid epidemic going on um, in addition to the COVID epidemic we're, we're dealing with. But let's look at what's going on here. So opioid effects. Why do people take opioids? Probably because they're in pain, right? So we're using it for analgesia. Some people use it because they like the euphoric effects. That's where we get a lot of the addiction that comes from uh, utilizing opioids. What's the danger of opioids? What kills these patients? Well, it's the CNS and the respiratory depression, right? They fall asleep, they stop breathing, and they die, right? So what can we do for that? And let's give you a few examples of opioids here, and we can look at their effect versus the, the dose we're giving these patients here. So here's an example of a full agonist. We have methadone. Methadone is a drug commonly used to help patients uh, get off of other opioids and eventually come off of them altogether. Here's an example of a partial agonist called buprenorphine. Uh, I may hear like you know, Subutex or Suboxone. This is the brain answer buprenorphine. And then you have an antagonist here called naloxone or Narcan. <clears throat> I'm not sure if any of you have a, you know experiences in the ER, but some of you may have seen naloxone uh, given previously, and you kind of know what those effects look like. But I'll get to that in just a moment here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you notice here with the full agonist and you're looking at the effect here, as long as I keep giving more drug and I've not bound up every single receptor available, I'm going to get increasing effect here. Notice though that if I give a partial agonist, notice here that the effects cap out pretty early as compared to the full agonist. So this is also another drug used for patients who are trying to um, come off of opioids, uh, may have an opioid addiction issue. Um, but what you notice here is like, well, why would I want to use a partial agonist for patients uh, as compared to a full agonist? Well, again, it depends on the use case. For a drug like methadone and buprenorphine, I'm typically using it for patients to help them get off of opioids. So maybe I'm just trying to prevent them from having uh, some of the effects of opioid withdrawals, for instance, and I only need a partial effect. I only need them to get to this point here just to keep them from having withdrawals to prevent them from going back to whatever opioids they used previously, like heroin or you know oxys or whatever they were using previously. So they only get partial effect here. <clears throat> well, look, notice the antagonist. Notice if I give naloxone, I get zero effect out of this because it's binding to the receptor, but it doesn't do anything. Right, just blocks it up and prevents other things from binding to it and preventing effect here. So if you ever have someone who has overdosed on an opioid, if you give them naloxone and you give them an appropriate dose to counteract the effect of a full agonist like oxycodone or hydrocodone or heroin, 
you can then completely reverse that effect. And so if you've ever seen someone get a dose of Narcan before, it is, uh, especially if they get a big dose of it, it is like watching The Exorcist because they will sit bolt upright. I mean, this person may have been non-responsive to painful stimuli. They may be breathing two times a minute. You give them Narcan, it immediately reverses that effect, happens within seconds. They're sitting bolt upright, maybe throwing up, maybe incontinent of stool, all kinds of things, and they're usually pretty cranky. Because basically you reverse all that effect there and you basically throw them into withdrawal immediately. They're breathing now, which is pretty good because now they're not going to die from that necessarily. But just you can see the actions there of comparing a full versus a partial versus an antagonist together, right? So just trying to illustrate that point. We'll talk more about opioids later though when we get to the sort of pain management talks. So um, then getting into talks of things like specificity. So you can have drugs that have like a high specificity for their targets, target receptors, and you have things with low specificity. So when I say high specificity, it means it's really working through just one type of receptor or it affects a very specific sort of like tissue or cells type or organ, whatever it happens to be. The benefit of that is it really helps to limit a lot of the adverse effects you're going to see because it's not interacting with other things that we don't really want it to interact with. So a good example of that, it would be if you have someone with an infection, with a bacterial infection. Now, if I were to give you antibiotics, I don't want to kill off your human cells. I want to kill off bacterial cells, right? So what I can do is give an antibiotic that is much more specific for bacterial targets because obviously bacteria is going to have different targets than what a human would in terms of proteins and things like that such that you're going to see limited adverse effects as the drugs are going to more affect the, the bacteria than it's going to affect the human, right? Things can have low specificity, though. It may be able to affect a lot of different types of receptors, may affect a lot of different tissues and cell sites, and they typically have more adverse effects. So a good example of this would be chemotherapy drugs that we use for uh, oncologic purposes, we use for cancer treatment, right? It is difficult for a lot of old-school cancer drugs to tell the difference between a cancerous cell and a healthy cell. And so when they get into the body, they interact with all of them the same. And so that's what leads to a lot of those characteristic side effects you see with chemotherapy. So things like alopecia, things like um, diarrhea and stomatitis, things like um, uh, a lot of the other issues they run into like uh, immune cell depression, right? They end up seeing immunosuppression. They're more at risk for bacterial and viral infections, right? Those are the things because the, the drugs can't tell the difference. They have low specificity versus something like an antibiotic having high specificity. Another good example is like tricyclic antidepressants. These are old school antidepressants we used to use more commonly for, uh, for depression, and they just affected so many different cell sites that weren't really pertinent to its treatment for depression. They had all kinds of side effects, and actually it was a pretty dangerous drug if the patient decided to harm themselves because of its low specificity. Now, uh, some of you may have flashbacks to organic chemistry with this one, but um, there's also the idea of stereochemistry, which is uh, an important concept in, in some cases here. So we'll talk about drug development in just a little bit, but basically most drugs come as what we call a racemic mixture, meaning that uh, depending on how these bindings are occurring, how the actual stereochemistry of the drug is, you may find that drugs may have both a right-handed side, uh, right-handed version, and then a left-handed version. These are basically mirror images of the same drugs and kind of think about it like your left and your right hand to where they're mirror images but they don't overlap with one another specifically um, so because of that you may find there's a little bit of different actions here between the left-handed versus the right-handed uh, version of the molecule which means that maybe more of the therapeutic effects come from the left side of version of it versus the right-handed version causes maybe more of the side effects so in some cases, we may be able to isolate out one or the other in order to get something that may have less than toxic effects and better therapeutic effects potentially, okay? We call these individuals enantiomers, right? So there's a racemic mixture of both left and right, and then we have the enantiomers, either the right-handed or the left-handed uh, version of the molecule, okay? So why do you care about that? What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of drugs out there that you can actually look at the name of it, the generic name, and determine if it's an enantiomer or not, right? So for example here, we have albuterol, which is, uh, you know, Ventolin's a common brand name here. Um, a, a The left-handed version of it is levalbuterol, right? So this is a completely different drug, dosed differently because it is only the left-handed version of the racemic mixture of albuterol, right? Or the antidepressant drug citalopram and escitalopram. Escitalopram is just half of that racemic mixture, right? Because it's a left-handed version, or cetirazine and levocetirazine. 
So what does that matter, right? Well, a lot of it matters in terms of uh, comparing the doses together. So for example, if I have five milligrams of the racemic mixture albuterol, and I know that 50% of it is the left-handed version, well, two and a half milligrams of that is gonna be equivalent to five milligrams of the racemic mixture. So two and a half milligrams of level albuterol is equivalent to five milligrams of albuterol. Or acetaloprim at 10 milligrams, the left-handed version is gonna be equivalent to the racemic mixture of 20 milligrams, right? Because now I have 10 milligrams of the left-handed, 10 milligrams of the right-handed version, right? So what that means is sometimes you have patients who will come into the hospital, for instance, and they need to continue a medication they're taking. They're taking one of these enantiomers, but we don't stock that. And you're sitting there, okay, well, I gotta have the patient on the drug, like what am I gonna do? Well, you can convert them back over to the racemic mixture. And if you know how to convert those doses from one another, that helps you to make sure you're gonna get similar effects out of that drug for that patient uh, than it would be if you just convert it one to one, right? Because then you would see you may only get half effect um, uh, de uh, depending on the situation there. So this comes up quite frequently. The other thing about this too is that patients or the uh, drug companies will get new patents on their drugs. And so um, they can then make more money because now they have a new brand name drug that they can sell. So I always find this to be really kind of funny here. Here's uh, the brand name drug Zyzal, which is uh, levocetirazine frequently used for allergies and antihistamine drug. And I like that they say here, wisely designed to be different. Active enantiomer of Zyrtec with no dextrocetirazine. You're like, wow, that sounds really smart. They must be, they must have done this for like a really good reason to isolate out and just use the levocetirazine. And then you look at it and it says the clinical relevance regarding the absence of dextrocetirazine is unknown. Oh, uh, so, so why was that wise? Why, why do we do that? Uh, you got a new patent, you make more money. Okay, that that makes sense. I mean, that, that may be wise from a financial standpoint. Does it help the patient at all? Not really, right? So you may have, you know, uh, you may interact with things like, you know, drug wraps and things like that that'll come in and say, oh yeah, you gotta you gotta use this, um, you gotta use this new drug. It is the best thing ever. And you may look into it, and be like, well, not really. Like it doesn't really matter if you're using the enantiomer or not. Like we don't have the evidence to show that. So just something to think about. I want to make sure you guys stay a little skeptical from here or there to make sure that you know you're not getting one pulled over on you potentially. Um, some other definitions: uh, down regulation. This is basically where a, a normal process where a cell is trying to prevent too much um, too much activity from occurring at the receptors, right? So say for instance, you're giving an agonist to the cell um, and you know, say they have 10 receptors available on the cell surface, right? It really wouldn't be 10, but let's say there's 10. And it's getting overactivated, it's getting too stressed out because of all, all this activation. Well, the cell can then downregulate the number of receptors available. So they can maybe, maybe now there's only five available now instead of 10. That's a, a, a bit of downregulation that has occurred there. And now that means you're gonna get less effect out of that drug because now it can only affect five receptors instead of 10. Okay, it does this to try to protect itself to prevent overactivation. Okay, and so in some cases, I may be able to give more drug to overcome that, depending on how many receptors are available. In some cases, I may not be able to get much more effect out of that. Okay, the opposite occurs though if I give an antagonist. So, for instance, if I give an antagonist and I'm blocking those receptors, the cell says, Well, I don't have enough activity here, so instead of having 10 at the cell surface, I'm going to provide 20 receptors. And so that then makes the patient more sensitive to the effects of an agonist uh, if one were to come and then bind to those receptors. So this is a common process that occurs here in order for the body to try to maintain homeostasis. And sometimes it interferes with the, uh, the ability for our drugs to work all that well. So we'll talk about specific examples as we go forward. Uh, a term I'll use commonly, uh, especially when talking about different routes of administration is gonna be bioavailability. This is basically the percentage of drug that gets absorbed after giving it via a given route. And we'll talk about routes of administration shortly, but it's important to compare the different routes in, in terms of comparing their bioavailability. So the best way to get 100% bioavailability is just to give something IV. If I give it directly into the veins, you're gonna get 100% of the drug in the, into the systemic circulation, it's 100% bioavailable, okay? So I give five milligrams IV, five milligrams is in the system. Now with oral though, which is probably gonna be the more common route of uh, medication administration you'll see, it can vary quite widely. Um, you know, it depends on a number of factors which we'll get into a little bit later. Some drugs cannot be taken via the oral route because it has zero bioavailability. I give you 100 milligrams of the drug orally and zero of it gets absorbed. That means that's zero bioavailability. Some things have 100% bioavailability, depends. We'll talk about why that depends in a little bit. 
Some of it has to do with what we call the first pass effect. And so this is um, primarily going to be seen with um, drugs given via the oral route that have to be absorbed from the GI tract. And basically, if you were to look at the uh, pathway from being absorbed from the GI tract to getting into the systemic circulation, getting into the bloodstream, basically everything from the GI tract gets funneled through the liver first and then into the systemic circulation. Well, what does that do? Well, the liver we're going to learn is really responsible for metabolizing the majority of drugs out there. So when the liver, when drugs are being passed through that liver the first time, um, some portion of that drug may be metabolized and made ineffective. So that means that uh, basically you're kind of paying a liver tax for that drug to get into the systemic circulation. And again, this varies based on the drug. Some drugs will have zero per first pass effect. So whatever gets absorbed from the GI tract goes right into the systemic circulation. Some drugs may not be bioavailable at all because all of it gets metabolized in the liver as you pass through the GI tract. So again, it's going to vary pretty widely. We'll talk about those specific examples as we get to it. One thing that's kind of interesting, though, is you can have what we call pro-drugs. Now, um, pro-drugs does not mean that there's like amateur drugs, but pro-drugs basically means that when you take this drug initially, it is inactive. If I were to give this drug IV, it wouldn't do anything initially because it is in an inactive state. But what's cool about these is when you give them via the oral route, they can then, as they pass through the liver, they get metabolized and get turned into the active form. So call them a pro-drug because it is basically kind of before it's the, the active form. And so this mainly happens in the liver here. So a good example of this is the drug we use for ADHD called Listexamphetamine or Vyvanse. Vyvanse itself is inactive initially, but when it passes through the liver after taking it orally, it gets turned into dextroamphetamine. So that's going to be then the active form you're going to see there. I'm trying to see if my stream is getting hitched up a little bit. But anyway, so the dextroamphetamine is going to be the active form of the pro-drug less dexamphetamine. Okay. Uh, another term we're going to talk about more when we get into the pharmacokinetic section is going to be this term of volume of distribution. This is basically going to be um, sort of a theoretical sort of concept, but it, what it's kind of telling us is where does a drug go once it gets into the systemic circulation? Does it like to hang out in the bloodstream? Or does it like to distribute far out into the tissue? And so what's kind of the percentage there between how much it likes to be on the tissue versus how much does it like to be in the bloodstream? And a lot of this is going to do with things like lipophilicity and all of that. We're going to talk about a lot of that later. But just know this is an important concept when it comes to um, the kinetics of a drug, is that volume of distribution. So we're going to get a lot into that later on. So now I want to transition over and talk about routes of administration. And so when I say that, it basically means um, Am I giving this drug IV, IM, sub-Q, oral? What's the difference between all of these different routes of administration? What does that mean in terms of drug effects for our patients? So looking at this, this is a good table you can refer back to in terms of comparing your different routes of administration to one another to seeing, okay, well, you know, what's the difference between giving something IV versus sublingual versus rectal? Um, you don't have to memorize these numbers necessarily, but just have a good idea in terms of relative bioavailability from one another, right? Know that oral is going to have the most variability as opposed to IV always being 100%, okay? Also, these are good characteristics to remember if you get a question asked on a test, for instance. So this is good for your reference. I'll go through all of these points here when we get into uh, the actual routes themselves. So starting out, here is uh, the IV administration. This is kind of the most straightforward because it's going directly into the system here. The advantages of using IV administration is that it's a pretty fast onset. Within seconds to minutes, it should be kicking in for the patient because, again, you're putting it directly into the system. It's also titratable, meaning that if I'm giving, for instance, a continuous infusion of a drug, so I'm giving a constant amount per minute, um, you're going to find that uh, you can titrate that drug up or down in order to, to get a, the effect that you're looking for. So if I'm giving a drug to increase blood pressure, say I have a patient with sepsis and their blood pressure is really low, they're hypotensive, and I'm giving them uh, something like uh, epinephrine, right? and give them IV epinephrine, if their blood pressure is too low, then I can increase the dose, and if their blood pressure is too high now, then I can then lower that dose. That's titratable, right? It's also 100% bio, bioavailable, so I don't have to worry about any drug being lost anywhere. As long as it's going into the vein, it is in the system, okay? You'll find that the dosing can vary depending on the type of drug you're dealing with and the context. Um, most of the time, IV drugs will be given via intermittent boluses or intermittent doses, meaning if you get a drug, uh, say IV every eight hours, it would then be given as 
either like an IV push or say given over 10, 15 minutes, that's intermittent dosing because they're getting it every eight hours. Or it could be a continuous infusion, as I mentioned with that epinephrine uh, a few seconds ago. Now there's a concept of central versus peripheral administration. Um, these are pretty different in terms of where the actual drug is being deposited at, right? So when I say peripheral administration, that means that if you, I say get an IV placed in, um, in the arm, for instance, that's a peripheral site because that catheter is emptying the drug out right into those veins in the arm. And so that means that the drug has to travel through the venous system back up to the right side of the heart into the interferior vena cava and then get circulated around, right? Or IVC and then into the right side of the heart and then be circulated around to the rest of the body. Now, that's all well and good, but some drugs may not be able to be given um, peripherally because they can uh, potentially cause some big issues if done so, or they could irritate the veins, or maybe I can only give certain concentrations of the drug um, because they're so irritating to the veins in a peripheral administration. There is what we call central administration, and so this is where, um, and it's more labor intensive because someone actually has to come place this line, but it's typically going to be something that is going to be uh, the catheter ends in the IVC, in the inferior vena cava. So sometimes you can have what they call like a pick line, we hear a central line, those are kind of different terms you'll hear for the same thing, but basically it dumps out into the IVC where there's a lot more blood flow happening. And so I can give really concentrated drugs potentially, or I can give drugs that are inappropriate to give peripherally, I can give them centrally. So um, here's an example of that, here's a drug called phenytoin that if it potentially extravasates, when I say extravasation, that basically means if the drug, um, say the line blows and it starts to deposit into the tissue surrounding uh, the vein there, or if it irritates the vein so much it causes some issues here, you can see that this actually causes severe tissue necrosis. This is a big problem. We don't give phenytoin peripherally if we can avoid it because of the risk of having something like this. It could lead to amputation potentially. So instead, we'd rather give that centrally if possible. So again, it's more labor intensive, but it helps us to um, provide drugs more safely in some instances. So disadvantages though of IV is once I give the drug, you kind of can't take back what you gave. So once it's in the system, it's there and you just got to wait for the drug to kind of do its thing and, and work its way out of the system there. Also, you want to worry about things like precipitation of substances. This is sort of a physiochemical incompatibility. There's a GIF here you can see of mixing calcium and phosphate together. You notice here it kind of crystallizes out. That's not great if that happens in your IV line, but it's also worse if it happens in the patient's lungs, for instance, and causes an embolus. So there's some disadvantages to it, but for the most part, this is the fastest way to get drugs into the system and working for your patient. What if you can't get a, a, a you know a vein though? What if you can't you know uh, you're dealing with an infant or dealing with someone who's really hypotensive and you can't get an IV started? What can you do instead? This is where we look at intraosseous administration. So this is where you can actually use um, this little power tool here. It's called EasyIO. This is just one one brand you can use, and basically this can be then deposited into the actual marrow of the bone itself, right? And so basically the bone acts as a big non-compressible vein that you can then um, administer drugs, you can administer fluids through, and for the most part, it works really well. So you'll see this a lot used in like pediatric emergencies. You may find this in adults who you cannot get a, um, an IV started for, and so you'll see the different sites you can use to, you don't have to memorize this for, for my purposes, I just wanted you to have an example of um, different uh, bones you could use potentially to get IV, or IOs placed potentially, but really useful during emergent situations here. Now, sub-Q administration is good for patients that need to use injectable drugs at home because obviously you don't want patients to get their own IVs set up because one, that's technically very difficult and you could lead to infection, you could lead to all kinds of issues here. So sub-Q is really good for self-administration. Um, we also can use this for things like implants and whatnot. So for instance, like there's um, implantable birth control you can use. Um, this is really good for insulin or certain anticoagulants you can utilize there. Um, has really high bioavailability but it's gonna be slower onset than IV or intramuscular administration. I'll talk about IM in just a second here. Um, some disadvantages though is that one, patients may be very needle phobic. Um, they may um, give themselves a skin infection potentially if they don't clean off the site, and they wanna make sure they rotate around the site. They don't wanna use the same spot every single time because that can lead to some issues there. IM is gonna be something, again, not often uh, used by a patient self-administration, more often by healthcare providers. Um, benefit of this is that it is um, good for drugs where you can't get an IV line or you don't need to start an IV, you just wanna give a one-time dose. It's good because it's less invasive than IVs. 
and still has a high bioavailability. A little bit slower than IV, but still pretty fast. Um, difficulties here though, disadvantages is one, it can be quite painful, especially depending on how much volume you're administering. Now for like an adult patient, I can give liters of fluid through an IV, but if I were to try to inject a liter of fluid into your muscle, that's not designed to hold all that volume. So it's gonna be quite painful. And usually you're limited to things like three mLs of volume that you can actually administer. So depending on how concentrated you can make that drug, you may be limited in terms of how much a drug you can actually administer, how, how big of a dose you can give because of that volume there. And so other things too is that it requires blood flow to perfuse the muscles to pick up the drug in the first place. So it may not be good if patients aren't really perfusing muscles that well. So for instance, like neonates or if you have like a hypotensive patient, and then two, you may find that if you have like an obese or emaciated patients, they have altered absorption depending on um, how well those muscles are being perfused or how much muscle mass they have. That can be an issue too. And certainly things like exercise and heat may also affect and increase absorption and make it a little bit more rapid in those cases there. And some examples of sites you might use include like the gluteus maximus, the deltoid, and the vastus lateralis. So those are kind of the more common um, sort of IM sites you're going to run into there. Uh, there's also intrathecal administration. So this is where you can actually inject drug directly into the spinal column. And this helps because it actually gets past that blood brain barrier that is a um, prevents a lot of drugs from getting through frequently. Um, usually that's a good thing, but in some cases we want to bypass that. And so this is good for like anesthesia purposes. So if I have someone who is going into labor, they can get an epidural that will allow them to be numbed up, say from the waist down, whereas everything else from the waist up is still intact and they can still feel and, and all of that. Um, antibiotics are sometimes given this way, chemo drugs, uh, it just depends. Um, placement's really key here, so this is why it needs to be done by someone who has training in performing things like lumbar punctures, usually anesthesia is responsible for a lot of these, just depends. And kind of the most common issues you run into are gonna be things like spinal headaches afterwards because you're puncturing through all that, uh, those layers of the dura and whatnot. Uh, next is sublingual administration. This is um, pretty handy if you have someone who um, can't take anything orally, uh, meaning they can't take, they can't swallow anything. Um, and this is good because it actually bypasses the liver a little bit because it doesn't, it gets absorbed through those mucous membranes and not through the GI tract specifically. So it actually has a little bit uh, higher bioavailability than oral drugs. And it's good if they're like actively vomiting and they don't want to swallow anything. So for instance, um, we give the drug on Dancitron or Zofran, we give it like water. In the ERs, if you come in, you're nauseous, you're probably gonna get some Zofran. But we give it as an ODT, which stands for orally disintegrating tablet, and that allows for it to be absorbed underneath the tongue and prevents a patient from having to swallow anything. The disadvantages though is that relatively few drugs can be given sublingually. Uh, another common one you may see as a sublingual drug is like nitroglycerin, used for angina and chest pain. Um, so limited number of drugs, but if you ever see that, that's how we're administering it. And then the oral route, this is the most common you're gonna run into for the majority of your patients because it's safe, it's um, you know most economical in a lot of cases here, but there are some disadvantages. So for instance, it requires patient compliance. So are they gonna be compliant actually taking that oral dosage form? Little kids don't like to take liquid medications. They might try to spit it out at you or you know they may not be able to swallow big tablets. And we have a patient with Parkinson's and they have dysphagia and they cannot swallow tablets or capsules. So all of that goes into deciding what kind of dosage form is best for your patient. Do you need liquid? Do you need solid dosage forms? It, it depends, right? But it is going to be uh, subject to first pass metabolism. Okay. And it really depends on the drug. Some drugs cannot be given orally because their bioavailability is so low based on first pass. Some drugs have almost no first pass and they completely get through. Just depends. And again, this is also subject to food drug interactions. I mentioned before the antibiotics, the fluoroquinolone class being bound up by milk, right? That was an example of a chemical antagonism where one bound to the other and prevented it from being absorbed, right? And so you could have like an elderly patient who has a UTI, they're taking Cipro, but you know, elderly patients are worried about osteoporosis, so they're drinking a bunch of milk, right? They may not realize that interaction occurs and they're not treating their infections. So now it turns into urosepsis and you're like, well, were you taking your drug like you're supposed to? And they're like, yeah, I was taking it, but they, don't realize that it's actually not working because of this uh, interaction here. Now, there are different dosage forms. So for instance, there's solid tablets. Here's an example of a capsule, which is a, has a gelatin shell around the, the medication here. Um, sometimes we'll have drugs called enteric coated drugs. And so this is basically meaning that it has a coating around it that prevents the uh, acid in the stomach from destroying the drug, right? 
And so basically it's acid stable uh, such that it will then, uh, once it passes the stomach and gets into the small intestine where the pH goes up pretty significantly, it will then dissolve. And that allows for the drug to then be absorbed. So if you ever see like enteric coated aspirin or some other drugs, here's an example of one. Um, this is probably something like a, a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole, which you may find over the counter. Um, these little capsules here are all enterically coated to allow it to pass through the stomach. And then once it gets into the small intestine, this little coating will melt away and then the drug can be absorbed. So just depends. And then we may use also controlled release preparations. And so these are um, sometimes called sustained release or extended release, just depends. And basically these are drugs that allow for it to be absorbed throughout the day. So maybe a drug, if I were to give it in the immediate release form, I would have to give it like every six hours or every eight hours. Whereas if I put it into an extended release preparation, I'd only have to take it one time a day, for instance. And so it's really good for compliance. And when I say compliance, that means patients actually taking the medication like they're supposed to. The more often they have to take it, the less they're compliant, less likely they are to be compliant to those regimens. There's the rectal route as well. So this is good for patients who can't take, uh, cannot take things orally. Um, and also about 50% of it bypasses the liver. So that means that you will get less first pass effect, meaning you get better bioavailability. Also the rectum is like really highly vascular. There's thin mucous membranes there. So you get pretty good absorption in a lot of cases, but you may find that, um, you know, depending on the situation, you may not get, uh, you know, full absorption of the drug, especially if they're having like a lot of like rectal contractions and that causes the drug to be expelled too early, things like that. But typically you'll find suppositories come in this, uh, it comes in a cocoa butter base. I'll try to say that 10 times fast. Um, but basically this will stay solid at room temperature, but then when it's inserted rectally and it's at body temperature, it would then melt down and allow for the drug to be absorbed there. Um, you'll oftentimes see them in these little foil packagings. Um, make sure the patients are told to take the foil packaging off because this can be a real pain in the butt if they try to in, uh, insert that really sharp tin foil there. Next up is the route of administration uh, of the inhaled route. So basically this is gonna be a lot of your inhalers and things like that. The advantages here is that um, the drug is getting directly to where it's needed. So if I have an asthmatic patient and they need to have bronchial smooth muscle relaxation, I don't want the drug to be affecting the GI tract and the CNS and all these other places. I just want it to work in the lungs. And so this is good for things like asthmatic patients or COPD, things like that. Some drugs actually get really quickly absorbed from the respiratory tract and they have really good bioavailability and they get to the brain really fast. And if you think about it, you know, the flow of blood in the body, you know, once it goes from the right side of the heart, goes to the lungs, then goes to the left side of the heart and then up to the brain potentially. So if I could, instead of giving an illicit substance IV, having to go through all that, all that uh, pathway there, I can just give it inhaled. It actually gets to the brain much faster. And so this is why crack cocaine tends to be very addicting is when they inhale it, it gets to the brain very quickly, cause a really intense high. And that's why it's so addicting. So I would not recommend crack cocaine to any of your patients, but not to say that you will not see patients who have uh, used it and it may be via the uh, inhaled route there. Um, the disadvantage here is that technique is really, really important. And if you're using it improperly, it's not gonna be all that effective. And so here's an example, I thought this picture was kind of funny cause it's like, well, that's not gonna work very well. That drug is just gonna be released into the atmosphere. She's not gonna get any drug there. She uses it like that. Um, this is why it's really important to educate patients on how to use it appropriately especially for things like meter dose inhalers, like you can see here, we actually have to depress a canister. Um, that takes dexterity, right? So if you have a patient with like rheumatoid arthritis and they have joint issues in the hands, they may not be able to use that very well, right? Maybe they have to use a nebulizer instead. So it really depends on the dosage form, what's gonna be appropriate for that patient there. Um, you know, little kids might not be really compliant with things like a meter dose inhaler, so you may need to nebulize it instead. Sometimes you'll find what we call dry powder inhalers, and this is where patients have to basically provide their own inspiratory force to get that drug to be uh, inhaled. And if they can't really inhale all that quickly because of issues, you know, respiratory issues, this may be a bad dosage form as well. So technique is really important. Education is really important. If you have uh, respiratory therapists that are available to you wherever you work, utilize them because they're gonna be really good at educating patients on how to use this stuff correctly. Uh, next we have the transdermal route. This is gonna be good for um, drugs that can be given over the course of many days. Um, and especially if you have someone who is uh, not likely to be compliant with a given drug, if they have to give it less frequently, sometimes that can help out. And so these are allow for controlled release through the skin uh, over the course of maybe one day, sometimes up to seven days, depends on the drug. 
Not all drugs can go through this route though. So if a drug cannot physically penetrate through the skin based on its physiochemical properties, then it's not gonna be a very good drug, right? So limited number of drugs that can do this, but when it's available, it's effective. Um, you don't wanna use these on open wounds because that can lead to enhanced absorption, better bioavailability, which can lead to toxic issues. Um, and then also the patches, if you were to look at this and look at this reservoir here, um, it is working off the concept of passive diffusion and you have to have a concentration gradient here in order to get that drug to be absorbed. We'll talk more about that later, but the point is is that when you get rid of these drugs and you throw them in the trash, there's still a lot of drug here left in the reservoir. There's not, it's not like you completely get rid of it. So because of that, there's a lot of issues in terms of like little kids getting into the trash and pulling these out. There's issues of animals getting into it and they could potentially, if they take it orally, all that drug can then be absorbed. It can lead to some big issues. I had a kid one time eat a clonidine patch. Um, I think the older sibling had given it to them. Um, clonidine is used to lower blood pressure. And of course the kid came in really somnolent, bradycardic, hypotensive. He ended up doing okay. Um, but uh, you know, it can be a big risk for poisoning there. So you wanna be cautious with those patches in the trash. There are other routes there as well. So things like ocular administration, oral administration. We'll talk more about those later as it become appropriate. Like we'll talk about vaginal administration. We get into the, um, the ob guide section later on. So we'll talk about those as they become pertinent. Okay, uh, another topic I wanna talk about today is drug development. I know it seems kinda like we're talking about a hodgepodge of stuff, but uh, I think it's good to get all these little miscellaneous topics out of the way. So that way when we get into the actual you know, organ systems and whatnot, we can kind of hit the ground running there. But talk about drug development, like how does the drug actually get to market, right? How do they actually get to the point where they can sell it? You can write prescriptions for it. And basically, it's under the purview of the Food and Drug Administration. They make sure that um, all foods, all cosmetics and drugs are safe to use, they're effective, um, they're not going to cause any issues that they're being released out there on the market. And so there's several different um, laws that are out there and i'm not going to have you memorize these laws by any means i just want to give you an illustration though that you know back in the day like it used to be the wild west i mean you could have tooth drops that used to contain heroin that used to use back in the old timey days um, nowadays you can't get away with that right because of different issues that popped up in terms of drugs being misbranded meaning they had labeling information that did not include what was actually in that product so it either would contain things that it didn't say that it had in there or say it did contain things that actually weren't there and so Initially, they put a law in place saying, okay, we got to make sure things are labeled appropriately. But they didn't have anything saying you have to be safe or effective, right? And then later on, they had an issue where they actually had a bunch of kids die because there's contaminated products. And that's where we actually get the FD&C Act, or the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this is kind of like the, um, the main law that sort of uh, affects most regulations around drugs and cosmetics and foods and all of that. And then even then, later on, there had to be another law made because of the issue of thalidomide. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We talk about like... Uh, tritogenesis and pregnancy and whatnot. But there's a drug that was used over in the UK that caused like limb malformations and in, in, um, in fetuses that were being, uh, the mothers were using the drug causing tritogenic effects on the fetus. And so then we had to say, okay, well, now we want to make sure that drugs are shown to be safe and effective. So um, the drug companies have to go through a lot of hoops to make sure that their drugs are safe and effective before they can go out into the market there in order to make sure we don't have issues like this to pop up. And so basically, Drug companies will start out by doing um, testing in animals, right? Sad for the animals, the drug doesn't work all that well, but that's how, how it is, right? That's a preclinical testing. And then when they have a candidate they think is gonna be good for use in humans, then the drug company will go and they get what they call an IND, or an investigational new drug application. And this is where they submit data to the company, or to the FDA, and the FDA says, okay, you're okay to use this for humans now, you can start at your clinical uh, phases, you can start with clinical testing here. And so basically, they'll then go through phase one, two, and three trials. They'll start out with phase one. If that looks good, then they'll then graduate to phase two, and then three, and then eventually they can give it out to the market and give it to the masses. So it's important to know that who's involved in each of these tests here. And so when you're looking at phase one, notice here it's healthy volunteers. You may have like 10 to 100 healthy volunteers that don't have the disease state in question. And this is used to determine what kind of effects you're going to get out of the drug, right? So if you are giving this to, if you're trying to market a new antihypertensive drug, you're going to give this to patients who don't have hypertension to see how safe it is and determine what kind of dosing you need to administer there. So that's the first phase. Once that looks good, then go into phase two, and this is where they're testing and say 50 to 500 patients. And these people do have the disease state, but now they want to determine how efficacious it's going to be in terms of treating those patients, how well it's going to lower that blood pressure. And then if they graduate from there, then they go to a few thousand patients, 
and they're further trying to establish their safety and efficacy. Once they finish phase three trials, they go back to the FDA and say, hey, we think this looks good. FDA reviews it and they say, yay or nay, okay? And then it goes out into the market. The problem though is like, if you have a one in a million side effect that occurs here, you're not gonna be able to find it in any of these clinical trials because you're not ever giving it to a million people. So sometimes there are things we discover once it gets out onto the market um, that potentially leads it to be recalled or taken off the market altogether. So as an example that just happened recently, uh, there's a drug ranitidine or Zantac. Zantac is a drug used to treat like GERD symptoms. It helps to reduce uh, stomach acid production. It's been around for like decades and decades. We've been using Zantac since forever. But now we all of a sudden realize, oh, well, actually Zantac, uh, you know, if it's kept in a hot temperature, it actually breaks down to a carcinogenic product. We didn't know that for the longest time. So who knows how many cases of cancer that's caused in the past, but it caused it to be removed this, just this, uh, this year. So it's one of those things where oftentimes we call the, um, once the drug is out on the market, we call that phase four trials. Because if you're taking a medication, you're technically a willing participant in that phase four trial, because we're still looking to see what kind of issues are actually gonna be popping up, right? And when we're giving the drug to millions and millions of people potentially. So again, just to give you an idea of just the number of chemicals that don't make it to market, for every 10 to 25,000 you start out with in the sort of basic research preclinical testing, maybe only one of them actually makes it out. And this explains to some degree why drugs are so expensive is because of the fact that they have to recoup the cost for all this testing they did for all the other ones that did not make it. Some other reasons too, uh, you know, we could probably talk a lot about the economics of drugs and all that, but I don't wanna uh, bore you too much more so than I already have. But again, just another way to show you uh, kind of how the phase trials are actually going along. Remember phase one, they're just trying to figure out the kinetics of it, figure out is it safe to healthy volunteers. And then phase two and three, they're giving it to patients who actually have the disease state to see how well it works, okay? And then it gets out on the market. One important point to note here is that from the time that the uh, drug manufacturers actually bring the, uh, once they get the IND, Okay, once they actually get that from the FDA, they only have 20 years to make their money back on that. If it takes them 10 years to get out onto the market, they only have 10 years then to sell that as a brand name drug before generics start to become available. Okay, If it takes them 15 years to get out on the market, they only have five years. If it only takes them five years, they have 15 years to make money, right? So it's in, they're incentivized to try to get through this part quickly in order to get out to the market so that way they can start recouping their costs. Um, so there's some, there can be some issues there with that. You know, obviously, for instance, with like a uh, coronavirus vaccine, we're probably gonna wanna push that out pretty quick. And so again, there may be questions like, well, okay, well, how many people do we test this on? Do we make sure we found all the safety issues that can pop up? So, you know, the, you'll find a lot of proponents um, of uh, sort of thinking to make sure, okay, are we doing enough testing? Are we really making sure that this is uh, safe and effective for everyone? I just mentioned that one because it is pretty topical. So here's another table you can look at. Um, you can kind of see the ideas of some of the costs involved with some of these things here. I'm not gonna go through all of this because I already kind of mentioned these already. So as I mentioned, phase four is that post-marketing surveillance. Um, anytime that we are you know, um, giving a drug to a patient, especially new drugs, and we see that, okay, wow, they had this weird side effect that wasn't listed in the drug in the package insert, we report that kind of stuff up to the FDA. So that's something that's important for that, that surveillance monitoring to make sure we've, we see these things. And in some cases, at least the drug's being taken off the market altogether, right? And again, the average cost of bringing a drug to market like $2.6 billion. So it's, it's an expensive venture uh, to do that, which is, may explain why some of these drugs are so expensive. Okay, um, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about receptor signaling. I'm probably gonna go for another 12 minutes or so and then I'll look to see if you guys have any questions, but you guys have been pretty quiet in the chat so far. But um, anyway, when I talk about receptors, basically I'm talking about the component that is interacting with the drug, right? Or whatever the endogenous ligand it may normally bind to. And there's gonna be different communication um, that happen here between um, signaling molecules, whether it be a drug, whether it be a neurotransmitter, and the receptor itself, right? And so it's important to understand how this signaling occurs within the body. So as I mentioned, the receptor is gonna be the specific protein that the signaling molecule is binding to. Again, the signaling molecule can be the drug, neurotransmitter, hormone, whatever the case may be. And basically the effector is whatever downstream mechanism that occurs once that receptor is then activated. Sometimes we'll have what we call secondary messengers, which we will talk about a little bit later on, um, that are gonna be interacting here where the signaling molecule, the drug is sort of the first messenger. And then this is part of the downstream response, as part of that effector response we see here, 
So um, looking at types of signaling between cells, you know, there can be contact dependent signaling where cells right next to one another can communicate. This is actually important here for like cancer because sometimes you'll see that these this uh, signaling does not occur, which allows for cells to keep kind of um, replicating sort of ad infinitum there. Um, this is also helpful for different types of immune functions when you have like T cells and things like that that are um, being uh, working as signaling molecules for different receptors to cause maybe antibodies to be formed or whatever the case may be. Paracrine signaling is where basically one cell is going to be then signaling out a signal to cells sort of in the similar region. Um, notice here though it's not really getting into the bloodstream necessarily. It's kind of just local signaling out to cells that are in the general vicinity. Um, two really important ones I'm going to talk about is synaptic and then endocrine signaling though. So when I say synaptic signaling, this is going to be really important for things like um, uh, you know, autonomic function, so parasympathetic and sympathetic functions. This will be important when we talk about things like depression and other mental health issues. We're going to talk a lot about neurotransmitters and how they work at the synapse. So again, you can find things from the uh, neuron being maybe originating in the CNS and transmitting all the way out to a target cell, maybe uh, very distant, maybe the heart, maybe um, also within the CNS. It can depend on where those um, different neurons are kind of projecting and where they're going to be signaling at. So this will be really important later on. We talk about both uh, mental health and, and autonomic function, things like that. Endocrine signaling is also really, really powerful because, again, endocrine cells, whether it be, say, for instance, the thyroid gland or the uh, pancreas, whatever, they're releasing hormones into the bloodstream, and that can then affect the whole body, right? So, uh, for instance, your adrenal glands, right now, maybe you're stressing out about farm, and so you're releasing all this cortisol into your bloodstream that's raising your blood sugar and your blood pressure, and it's causing uh, you to get a gastric ulcer to start to form. All of that, um, I'm just kidding, hopefully that's not happening to you, hopefully you're stress-free right now. Uh, we have plenty of time to stress you out. But basically, it's a really powerful signaling. And so this is when we're giving drugs. Frequently, this is what this is mimicking, right? We're giving a drug orally or IV, and then this can then go through and, and signal cells all over the body here, right? So it's going to be um, able to affect a wide variety of different tissues and different targets. So um, some other types of receptors you may run into. So here's an example of an enzyme that could be a target for a particular drug. So um, again, don't get too worried about this. this is just an example of um, how we produce some of our uh, nucleotides that we used to refer to DNA production, right? And specifically, this is how folic acid interacts with the system here in order to help produce things like uh, thymidine and, and other nucleotides. And sometimes we can actually interact with enzymes and either inhibit them or enhance them, and that is how the drug works. So, for instance, here's a drug called methotrexate, which you, if you've ever heard of it, it's used for things like cancer and for like rheumatoid arthritis. It's good because it actually helps to disrupt DNA replication, which is good for cancer because it actually helps to inhibit production of new DNA. And if you don't have new DNA, you can't make new cells. And so this actually works by targeting a specific enzyme in this system here called dihydrofolate reductase, right? So by targeting this particular enzyme here, this prevents this recycling of folic acid, and thus you cannot produce new thymidine and other nucleotides. So example, just uh, to give you, and again, we'll talk more about methotrexate extensively later on, but just to show you there's different targets that a particular drug can shoot for, and enzymes may be one of those targets. Sometimes transport proteins are going to be affected here. So here's an example of a uh, cardiac cell and looking at the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This will be really important for helping to regulate the uh, electronegativity of a cell. When you talk about resting membrane potential, this is super important for that, both in neurons and in the heart. And so you can see that you can have drugs that affect a transport protein. And so here's an example of a drug called digoxin, which will inhibit this protein and allow for a buildup of sodium within the cell that then allows for more calcium to come out. And so when you have more calcium coming out, that allows for better binding and more contraction. So it actually helps the heart to beat harder, which is good for someone who has something like congestive heart failure, for instance, right? And again, don't get bogged down in the details. We'll get to this later. So I'm just giving you some examples now just to try to illustrate the point. Sometimes we have structural proteins we're shooting for. So if you ever heard of the drug colchicine, this is frequently used for gout. Um, this actually helps to prevent the microtubules from forming within certain cells and actually helps to disrupt um, the ability for things like neutrophils to get to sites of inflammation. So you actually can work an anti-inflammatory drug by decreasing the ability for the cell to produce things like microtubules. So structural proteins can also be a target. But... Um, to talk about the main types of drug receptors, these are going to be the most common ones we're going to run into. Um, we're going to see they kind of can get broken down into four categories. So there's ion channel receptors, 
There are G protein coupled receptors, there's enzyme linked, and then intracellular receptors here. I'm trying to figure out if I have enough time to finish this talk up. Let me see how many slides I have left. Ooh, we got a lot of slides here. That's okay. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll see what I can get through here in the next couple of minutes. Um, so when we're talking about different types of uh, receptors here, at least the most common ones we're going to run into in terms of where drugs are interacting, again, we're going to see that most of them are going to be lying on the cell surface, but then some of these can also be within the actual, uh, in the cell, with the intracellularly, and it can work at the actual DNA within the nucleus itself. And so especially like a lot of hormones are going to be working through this process here of actually working in the nucleus itself. But a lot of drugs are just working at the cell surface. There's going to be a receptor there at the cell uh, surface site that they can interact with to then cause some kind of intracellular downstream effect to whatever it may be, whether it's decreased blood pressure or whatever the case is. Those cell surface receptors then get broken down into the ion channel linked ones, G protein or enzyme linked. Okay, I'm just going to give you some examples of what this looks like. So for instance, here's an ion channel linked receptor. Ion channel just basically means that when it opens up, it allows for certain ions to flow through. Sometimes this is not specific. Sometimes it's specific ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, whatever the case may be. And so this is really good because you, you have a lot of different things like neurotransmitters and things like that that will bind to these receptors. And then once they're activated, it will then open them up and allow for things to flow through. Sometimes you're going to find um, that the drugs can inhibit this process too, right? So they can actually block these from occurring and preventing ions from flowing through along their, uh, their gradient, right? So they flow from high to low concentration there. So that's one uh, site we're talking a lot about that when we get into CNS stuff, talking about behavioral health stuff with things like GABA and serotonin and glutamate. That'll be really important later on. You can see here that... Um, they're made up of different structural proteins, and then based on the actual subunits here, you may find that they can have different activity, right? So you'll hear, um, specifically, we may talk about different subtypes of receptors, So, and that depends on these different structural proteins. So if you ever hear me talk about GABA-A channels versus GABA-B channels, right, you can find a lot of differences there, or like um, serotonin you know, 2B or 5A or different things like that. A lot of it has to do with the subunit here and, and it can cause them to act differently. They may be different targets for different drugs based on that. So for instance, if I'm dealing with a, a serotonin uh, 5A receptor, that helps to decrease things like nausea and vomiting. If I'm talking about a 1D, 1B, I'm talking about things that help with migraine. So again, depending on the, the actual uh, breakdown here of the different subunits, you can find wildly different effects depending on the site. And again, you can consider here that there's a lot of variety here. Um, I'm not gonna get too in the weeds in terms of this, but a lot of it has to do with the type of tissue you're dealing with, with how you're splicing the different uh, bits of DNA, how you transcribe that in order to figure out what type of subunits a particular type of cell is going to express. So whether it's gonna express a, a serotonin 5A molecule, uh, receptor or a 1B, 1D, it just depends on the case there. And just to give you an example that here's a, a, a nicotinic uh, receptors here uh, that bind to acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds nicotinic receptors. And if you're dealing with it in the skeletal muscle versus the CNS versus the autonomic ganglia, you can see here they can have different activities, whether they're allowing for permeability of calcium versus permeability of sodium and potassium. Don't memorize this. I'm just trying to show you that there are, uh, depending on the tissue you're dealing with, even the same receptor and the same molecule here, acetylcholine, can have wildly different effects. So then uh, here are just a few other examples here. You may run into some things like nicotine binding to acetylcholine receptors. These are examples of drugs that can actually interact with the system here by mimicking what the natural ligands would do. Um, you know, we can have drugs that block calcium channels. Calcium is really important for um, muscle contraction and things like that. So if I block those calcium channels, I can lower blood pressure or I can decrease heart rate. Uh, I can prevent migraines potentially. So a lot of different examples here. We'll get to each of these individually uh, later on, but these are just some examples you can kind of um, uh, see by giving these different types of medications what they can do in the body. So I, I'm actually going to cut it there, I think. Um, we'll get to the G-protein coupled receptors next time. Um, class will be at 8 o'clock next Tuesday as well, just FYI. Um, if you have any questions, please post them up in the chat. I'm going to check that sticky board to see what's on there. Um, See, no questions on here yet. Okay, so Brandon Dennis is asking, does the first pass effect occur every time a patient takes a drug or does it only occur during the very first occurrence a patient takes a drug? It's a great question. Um, every time that that drug passes through the liver is gonna go through that, that issue. So every time 
uh, that patient takes a drug, they're going to go through that first pass effect. And you may have things that um, alter first pass effect. You may have drugs that may enhance it. You may have drugs that actually inhibit it. So as we're going to talk a lot about those drug interactions that can affect that. Later on, we get to the pharmacokinetic section um, sometime, probably next week if I had to guess. Um, what other questions do you all have? So in terms of other stuff to do for this week, uh, let me see here. So there is... Um, there's a couple of readings here. It's, it's real quick. You just have to uh, view them. Um, basically, when we do our assignments, um, if you're going to be citing anything, I wanted to make sure you use AMA citation style. This is most frequently used in a lot of um, medical journals and things like that. So just review that some way if you're going to reference something. And I'll, I'll tell you in the, in the assignment if you need to do that or not. Make sure you, you have that there so you can um, cite things appropriately. Other than that, though, um, that's it for this week. If you have any questions, though, please email me. Let me know. Otherwise, um, you're free to go. I'll stay on for a few minutes in case anyone else has questions. And if you want, you can come back and review the, the video later, um, all that. So it's totally up to you. Otherwise, you guys have a great week, uh, and I will see you next time. Let me see if anyone, as my viewers start to drop down. Where can we view the video later? You can use the same link. Um, basically, it'll just be uh, this recording here, so you should have that available. So go right back to the uh, Blackboard site and you can use that. No problem, Alyssa. Let's see, uh, when you're talking about stereochemistry, you're using racemic right-handed side interchangeably, is that right? No, uh, so the racemic mixture means racemic is the combination of the left and the right-handed together. So if you have like a racemic mixture, it means it's 50-50 split between the left and the right-handed. Um, when you separate those out, that's when you have the individual enantiomers. So usually the right-handed molecules, if you see like dextroamphetamine or dextromethorphan, that's what usually the right-handed side See like Lev or S, uh, that's usually going to be the left-handed side of the molecule. No problem. Any other questions? See a lot of you still hanging around just in case someone asks a question, but... That's okay. You can always come back and look at the video later if you miss something. Let's see, are the videos found on Blackboard? Yeah, so you can go to the same link. Um, so when this is over and I finish the stream, uh, if you click on that, it'll take you right back to the, the recording of this. So that's kind of the nice thing with... Uh, YouTube is like it's automatically there, so you don't have to like wait for it to be posted up later or anything. I record it on my end just in case like something catastrophic happens, I can go back and kind of edit something together, and I'll I'll give you the link for that if that happens. But if it's the live stream goes good, then I don't have to do anything with it. No problem. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and cut the stream off here. You guys have been great, and I will uh, see you all next week.